worship the Lord our God. I look it up. I look up there at those children if I counted correctly, I, and I wasn't paying particular attention, but I think there were eleven of them. And I, I think what a blessing our children are, Amen. and how blessed they are to have parents and grandparents that will bring them to be taught the truth about God and about His Son Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us today, that and I remember my first time in this congregation, I thought, Jam, what is that? Well, that stands for Jesus and me. And it took me a minute or two to get, uh, get that concept in my mind about taking the children out because this is not something that I'd uh, seen before. But uh, our children deserve all the extra instruction that we can give them on their level. And sometimes the things that are said from the pulpit during this period of time would escape them, being a little bit beyond their understanding. I really didn't need to get up here this morning. Uh, Brother Ken preached part of my sermon for me. He didn't realize it, of course. But we're going to touch on some of the same things that he talked about. And I would direct you, <coughs> excuse me, I would direct your to uh, Acts chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be talking about what happened on that first, uh, on that Pentecost when the first gospel sermon was preached and the reaction to that, both positive and, uh, and I'm going to say neutral rather than say negative. But let's just begin, <clears throat> let me begin at Acts chapter 2 and start reading at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And that, day, that same day, and the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And you read that and you think, what a great response to the preaching of the gospel. And looking back in time, this was seven weeks because there was seven weeks between the, the uh, Passover and the Pentecost. This was seven weeks after Jesus had been taken and crucified and reportedly by his disciples and others who had seen him had been resurrected and walked around alive after that. And you can imagine, if you'll take your mind back, uh, among this great gathering, and it's estimated there was upwards of sometimes of, of a million people in Jerusalem for the Pentecost. Imagine, if you will, all these people talking about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, about the things that he had done, the things that he had said, about the trouble he had with the religious leaders and how ultimately he was taken and crucified. And here we have people saying, well, no, he, he didn't stay in the grave. He was resurrected. This probably had, in my mind at least, been a topic of discussion among most of the people during that period of time. I mean, how could you quit talking about this? Because some of the people that were, were there and discussing this would have said, yes, this was the Messiah. And were mourning his death and his treatment and dreading the judgment of God on this nation because of the way he had been treated. And then you look on the other hand, there were others who considered him a heretic and a blasphemer a false teacher were glad to be rid of him and, and thought he got what, he, what was coming to him. And I doubt, once again in my mind, 
that there have been very many people who were neutral on the subject. We're not told much about what the apostles were doing during this seven week period. Luke ends his book by saying that they were together uh, daily in the temple praising God and, and, and blessing. So we don't have much input from them at this time. But then, excuse me. But Jesus had promised them, he had told them to, to remain in the city of Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. And so they had. Then came the fulfillment of what Jesus was talking about. Still in Acts chapter 2, we go back to verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like of as, as of fire, and it set upon all of them, each of them. Then they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And they would come. To, this is one of the times when Jewish men were supposed to come to Jerusalem. Now, when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard and speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled and said one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans, which was the same as saying these are uneducated men. How do they know how to speak in these languages? It's obvious they had not studied them. What's going on? And now we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites. And it goes on to talk about uh, 15 different nationalities of people who had gathered there together and they were hearing because the apostles were speaking in their home language. What was going on? Well, somebody said, oh, these men are drunk. They're full of new wine. And that's why, why they are doing all of this. But what they didn't realize at the time, and Peter was about to tell them, that this was the fulfillment, the beginning of fulfillment of prophecy that they all knew. Devout men, Jewish men who had studied the Old Testament and knew what the prophets said concerning the Messiah were familiar with these scriptures because they dealt with them all the time. <clears throat> They preached to them, Peter and the others. They preached to them about the miracles of Jesus, about how he was a man who went about doing good. And his miraculous, his miraculous, work, his miraculous works were known to everybody. And Peter said to them uh, that ye yourselves also, also know. What he had done was not done in a secret. He had not gathered people out here under a tree away from the rest of the city. He had been in the midst of all the people when these things were said and done. It's like Paul told King Herod Agrippa in Acts 26 and verse 26, this thing was not done in a corner. It was all common knowledge. It was all done in public. And this is Peter's point, as he says, you yourselves also know. And even John the Baptist's disciples came and asked him, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew chapter 11, beginning verse 2, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go now and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Proof. Evidence. This is the Messiah. 
Peter could have told them about many miracles of Jesus, and we don't know but what he did because the part I read at the beginning said, with many other words did he testify and exhort to them, saying, Save yourselves. So we don't know what was said that day. We do have an outline of a lot of the things he said. He could have told them how Jesus healed these crowds of sick in, in, uh, in the city of Capernaum in Mark chapter 1. Let's just read that also. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 32. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and that were possessed with devils. And all the city, once again, this was not done in a corner. All the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed them that were sick of divers disease and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. People knew about the works of Jesus, didn't they? He could have told about still in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He could have told about curing lepers. Mark chapter 1 again, this time verse 40. And there came a leper unto him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou could make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. He could have told them about Jesus raising the dead, about the uh, son of the widow of Nain, about the daughter of Jairus, who was more than just a common person. He was a ruler of the synagogue. Personally involved in these people's lives, doing good for them, raising the dead, these other things, you know, they, they tried to say that uh, Jesus' enemies tried to say that this was just witchcraft or, or he was doing, like we would say, smoke and mirrors. But who could heal a leper and who could raise the dead? And it was common knowledge of the things that he had done. And many of those who lived in Jerusalem knew from personal experience about him raising his friend Lazarus. Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. Lazarus, who, in the words of his sister, by now he stinketh. You couldn't say that this was fake. You couldn't say that Lazarus was merely sick. Lazarus was dead and his body was beginning to decay. And yet Jesus called him forth from the grave and he came out alive. And it was witnessed by many people from the city of Jerusalem. And some of them went back and reported to the Pharisees and they believed it too. They couldn't deny it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, saying, and they said, What do we do for this man doeth many miracles? Well, they could have believed in him, couldn't they? They could have joined in with his other disciples and obeyed what God was telling them to do. But these men were enemies of Jesus. What do we do for this man doeth many miracles? And so they conspired about how they were going to get rid of him. Why did Jesus do all these miracles that we read about? The Bible tells us, doesn't it? John, cha <clears throat> John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. No doubt asking him about the kingdom because... Jesus replied to him in terms of the kingdom. But Nicodemus approached him and said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these signs that thou doest, except God be with him. It was undeniable that this man was operating by the power of God. And they of Pentecost felt this, and they couldn't deny his power. And John wrote later concerning the miracles that he did in John chapter 20, <clears throat> beginning in verse 30. 
Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. The purpose of it, to give proof that this was not just an ordinary man standing up here doing these things. This was a man operating with the power of God. And who could do this? They preached the Christ of prophecy, and the Jews knew these prophecies of the Messiah. And Peter used these prophecies to show that Jesus was the Christ. Beginning in, in <coughs> excuse me, in, once again in Acts chapter 2. He, <coughs> beginning in, in uh, beginning in, in verse uh, 16, excuse me. Men and brethren, this scripture must be needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spoke by the mouth of David. I'm sorry, I got the wrong scripture there. We're talking about Joel's prophecy to explain the fact that these men were speaking in languages that they did not know. I guess if I get on the wrong on the right page, I could do. Uh, this a little bit better. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he goes on to quote some more from, from the prophet Joel. Beginning in verse 25, he uses the words of David concerning the resurrection. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on, on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou forgive it. Suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And verse 30 and 32 points to that fact. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither would his flesh see corruption this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses all witnesses therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost he has shed forth this which you now see and heard for David is not ascended into the heavens but he saith in himself the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou on the right hand until I make thy foe that footstool. Yes, the Jews knew these prophecies. And there were other prophecies that, uh, that he could have cited to them. The fact that he was born in Bethlehem, according to Micah 5 and verse 2. That he was of the seed of David, uh, uh, Psalms 89. The manner of his life was foretold in Isaiah 53. His betrayal was foretold by Zechariah. The price for which he was sold in Zechariah chapter 11, 12, and 13. The holes in his hands, Zechariah 13, verse 6. The 22nd Psalm, which de describes the crucifixion. How could they, knowing these things and being familiar with these things and studying these things constantly, not recognize him as the Messiah? Well, for one thing, the Jews were looking for an earthly uh, kingdom and, and he did not come to establish an earthly kingdom. He didn't co come to sit on a white horse and lead them in battle against the Romans and, and get them, rescue them from Roman rule. 
Peter preached that these were the last days and that they had trusted in the proph these prophecies for centuries. And now they were preached for pro with proof. Proof of the life of Jesus compared to the predictions made by all these prophets. Things that were undeniable even to his harshest critics. How could they not believe? The apostles preached the resurrection of Christ. And Peter used that prophecy of David concerning the resurrection. And the Jews were very much aware of this prediction of his resurrection. And at the time of his crucifixion, they went to Pilate desiring a guard to be put over the tomb so that his disciples would not be able to come in and steal the body and say, well, he's resurrected, he's gone. There were many witnesses to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, the apostles themselves. There were other disciples who saw him. Paul says that he appeared to above 500 brethren at one time, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul discusses the resurrection. The Bible says with many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation? Imagine some of the things he could have said. Well, you guys put a guard on the tomb. Where's the body? Hundreds of people saw him alive after the resurrection. How can you argue with this? You might be able to say, well, you 12 were his close disciples. You're standing up here lying for him. But these 12 had demonstrated the power of God in themselves. It was undeniable. The resurrection of Christ was basic to the gospel is the proof of his deity. Paul wrote that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1, verse 4. And with all this evidence, with all this testimony, with all this fulfillment of Scripture that they were so familiar with, yeah, 3,000 people responded that day. Out of goodness knows how many were present in the temple when this happened. The question comes to my mind, why only 3,000? What about the rest of the people who heard this and no doubt believed? Why did they not respond? Did they need more evidence? How much more evidence would it take to persuade somebody that this Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Christ, the Son of God. When Peter summed this up in verse 36, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now they that heard this were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you can... Have you ever been in trouble? Have you ever done something stupid and got yourself in trouble? <laughs> if not, you're, you're a, unique, a unique individual. I tell you what, being in hot water is a very uncomfortable thing, isn't it? Knowing that you've done wrong, hopefully realizing, coming to your senses and backing out of that wrong, and making corrections in your life to take care of it before somebody else has to come to you and do it for you. Can you imagine how these men, religious men, faithful to their religion, now learning that they had been party to the murder of the Messiah for which that nation had waited for centuries. All this, this waiting, this anticipation for the great Messiah to come, and now He's come, and you guys put Him to death. Men and brethren, what shall we do? You can almost hear their voices quaking with emotion as they ask that question. They couldn't go back and undo what had been done, could they? 
No, of course not. But God's plan for the salvation of the souls of men was presented to them in very simple, plain terms. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And there you have it, brethren. Now, what's so hard about that? Why was it impossible for the others besides the 3,000 who did respond? Is it because they anticipated problems from their family? Is it because they were unwilling to separate themselves from a, a group they might have been part of that did not believe? Do you suppose they were afraid somebody would make fun of them for being a Christian? They preached the promise of God. God had promised Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so long they had looked for fulfillment of the promise. And now, knowing what they had done, and feeling this to their very souls, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, you know, we, we, we look at this and we think, yeah, I can understand these men responding as they did. And we think, what a great response to this gospel sermon that was preached. And how preachers today long to get that kind of response from their words. But once again, this, this, this question keeps playing in your mind. In the light of all this testimony and this proof, in the light of the testimony of these 12 men plus others that were willing to say, oh, yeah, we saw him after his resurrection. In light of their knowledge of the Old Testament prophets and seeing the fulfillment there before their eyes, why only 3,000? It's a mystery, isn't it? And we think, how could they have been so hard-hearted? How could they have been so firmly rooted in their doubting that they could say no to all that proof? And friends, men today hear the same subject taught week after week. We all have sinned, Romans 3.23. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. Verse 10, the same chapter tells us the same thing. Jesus died to take away the stain of our sins. Ezekiel has said back in 18 verse 20, the soul that sinneth this shall die. And we're talking about the death of the soul. And we've all sinned. We know that. We sit here under a sentence of death. And yet here comes Jesus who died for us on that cross and took away our sins and gave us the formula by which we might join with Him when we're baptized into Christ we put on Christ Galatians chapter 3 it's like wearing a garment everybody ought to be able to see it Christ living in us Paul writes, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Week after week, men like me stand up here and tell that same story and try to, to make sure that everybody understands and encourage those who have not put on Christ in baptism to do so. And yet, just like the rest besides the 3,000 that day, some linger back and do not. My friend, there is no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to have your sins forgiven except to have them washed away in that watery grave of baptism. 
That is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But he invites all who are outside to come. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The invitation is yours. If you're outside of Christ, we would love to help you to get where you belong. Or if there's some other reason for which you need to respond, come, please come forward while we stand and sing. sing one more song and then uh, one more song and then Brody will lead us in closing prayer. If you would please turn to number 555. 555. We'll sing the first verse of this please. John. We are thankful for the privilege of being able to listen to Brother Dawson. Now let us be led in prayer by Brother Bodie. You're welcome. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you have given us. Lord, we ask that you please forgive us of our sins, both known and unknown. Lord, please be with Brenda and Cliff, and please help Brenda get the strength to overcome this sickness. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of being able to come and worship you, and we ask that you please be with these people.
These be with Brooke Allen, Ryder Hall, Audrey Stewart, and Katie Stewart. Please be the Cindy Waller, Cindy Bridges, and Jace Griffin. Lord, please be with the soldiers and please be with the officers, especially the ones down in Ukraine right now. Lord, please let everyone have a safe trip home and please let everyone have a good good rest of their day. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.